You're listening to episode number 264, and this is the last podcast in the series called The Sex Talk. Today, we're talking all about men's sexual health. This is the Made for Living Well podcast, hosted by Alexa Sherm, the place to create a life well-lived. Welcome back to this podcast. As always, my name's Alexa, and this is the place where I believe you were made for living well. And that is why we're talking all about sexual wellness, because that's actually a major part in your overall health. We can't ignore it, and so we have to understand it. And that's exactly why I did this podcast series called The Sex Talk. Now, today we're rounding out the series with the very last episode inside the series, and it's an honor to have Dr. Morgan Toller on to talk about men's health. Now, men's health, while becoming a more widely known topic, is also a topic that maybe has a lot of misconceptions and still tends to fly under the radar. But today we're going to break down some common misconceptions. We're going to talk about testosterone, low testosterone, uh, erectile dysfunction, vasectomies, and so much more as I asked Dr. Morgan Toller some of your most pressing questions that I received at the start of the sex talk. Dr. Morgan Toller is an internationally renowned expert in testosterone therapy, prostate cancer, and male sexuality. He is credited with founding Men's Health Boston, the first center that specifically focused on men's health. Dr. Morgenthaler is an associate clinical professor of urology at Harvard Medical School, and he lectures nationally and internationally to teach physicians the latest information in the diagnosis and treatment of conditions affecting men's sexual and reproductive health. He's a regular contributor to television and radio shows addressing male issues and has appeared on NBC, CBS, CNN, and The Connection on NPR. He is also author of several books, including The Viagra Myth, testosterone for life, and the truth about men and sex. I will make sure and link all of that up in the show notes, as well as Men's Health Boston, where you can reach out to learn more or get a consult. Now, before we get to today's show, I do want to remind you, as this is the last episode in the series, to check out the podcast sponsors, including Yarlap and Athletic Greens. Now, as you know, I'm a big fan of Athletic Greens, not only because you get over 75 vitamins, minerals, adaptogens, and probiotics every day, but because it fills in the gaps where it's necessary in the places that your body really needs those nutrients. As I told you at the very beginning of the series, I underwent my own experiment with Athletic Greens to see if it was actually paying off. Because one, no one wants to spend extra money on things that don't matter. And two, does it even taste good? Is it something you crave? Or is this something you're just going to have to choke down? Now, what I found was pretty astonishing. I took a micronutrient panel at the start of Athletic Greens and after 60 days, and I found that it actually did increase almost every micronutrient inside of my body in a positive way, getting myself back into the healthy range. Plus, I found it actually tastes good. I mean, it's still a green drink, but it is certainly one of the better ones. I don't even get the post-green shivers, and honestly, I kind of crave it in my everyday life. It has a mild tropical flavor that goes down smoothly, especially if you add the secret ingredient, ice. Yes, ice your athletic greens, and I promise you, it goes down so easily. Now, if you haven't tried Athletic Greens or you want to learn more, make sure you check them out at athleticgreens.com backslash livingwell or just head on over to thelivingwell.com. If you use my link, you get five free travel packs as well as a year-long supply of vitamin D, which is perfect and essential for this time of the year. Yes, you're going to love Athletic Greens. They have an amazing customer support. And honestly, even if it's not something you take every day, but every couple of days, it can really, again, fill in those gaps to help boost your immune system, regulate your hormones, and so much more. I also have my kids take Athletic Greens once in a while when they have time or I can get them in their bodies as just, again, that whole food support that our bodies are looking for. So again, check that out at athleticgreens.com backslash living well. And stay tuned as I tell you more about Yarlap coming up later in this podcast. Okay, but for now, let's get right to today's show. Welcome to the show, Dr. Morgan Toller. I'm excited to have you on and talk about a subject that is not wildly talked about in the space of health or life in general. So thank you so much for being here. 
Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. So you're a men's health expert and you know, you've studied a lot of uh different hormones and other issues uh, in regards to men's health. And I just want to know as we start this podcast, what are some of the biggest misconceptions that you recognize or maybe encounter on a daily basis in your practice? Alexa, first of all, let, let me just say uh, it's a pleasure to be with you and thank you for inviting me. And I'm so glad that you're addressing this topic today. So, you know, I've been, uh, I'm, I'm a urologist by training mm-hmm. and um, and a specialist in what I would call men's health, which involves a couple of things like male sexual issues and male infertility issues. And, um, you know, I was full-time, I've been on the faculty at Harvard Medical School for, I think, 35, 36 yeah. years. And... Um, and, you know, I started off as a uh, researcher together as a clinician. And in uh, the late 1990s, I went to the head of uh, the hospital where I was at, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. It's one of Harvard's teaching hospitals. And I went to speak with the president because every hospital in Boston and, uh, and many outside of Boston had women's health centers. Mm, yeah. And there were none that had any men's health center. As a matter of fact, this term, Men's health barely existed, mm-hmm. barely existed. I think the, there's a, a journal called Men's, like the magazine, Men's Health. But it was mainly about muscle and fitness and things like yeah. that. But as a real health issue or medical issue, it didn't exist. And I went to the president and I said, um, you know, I practice what I think could be considered men's health. And what I did, I told him, I do hormone therapy for men, testosterone primarily, um, male infertility, male sexual issues, some prostate. I think that's men's health. And he loved the idea and said, let's do, I said, we should open up the first men's health center. Yeah. And he said, let's do it. But when I found out that it would probably take about four years to do it in, you know, the big bureaucracy, Mm -hmm. I went out on my own and in 1999 opened up the first comprehensive men's health center in the United States, which was called Men's Health Boston. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's what we did for 20 plus years. Um, And so, you know, what I've learned over the over all that time is exactly as you point out, is um, there's a lot of misconceptions. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of men who are suffering unnecessarily. And we have a whole bunch of treatments for men. And sometimes really all they need, in fact, is information. But sometimes there are things that they've got a real problem and we can treat those. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have any big misconceptions when it comes to like specific ones, like when it comes to men? Because I I was even talking to a man the other day and he's like, honestly, I didn't even really know I had hormones and the way that you hear women struggling with hormones. He's like, I didn't even really know that was a thing or a possibility with men. Which I guess, I mean, you know, we hear about women's hormones, like you said, all the time and these women struggle and, you know, kind of the sexual field tends to revolve around women and their struggles, but men are probably equally as struggling with issues as women. Do you think that's a fair percentage? Yeah. Absolutely. Listen, so uh, um, I have a title chapter in my last book, which is called the book is called um, The Truth About Men and Sex. Yeah. Um, and there's a chapter that's titled Men Are Hormonal Too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and um, you know, what's not, we have a lot of misconceptions, both in the public and in, in the medical community about testosterone, you know, and so we say things like it's almost like a mythical Mm-hmm. Um, substance, right? So, you know, we talk about like stockbrokers, you know, during a frenzy, like, oh, it's that testosterone driven activity. Not really. We say when guys get into fights, it's testosterone that's doing it. Not really. Um, and most people know about testosterone because bodybuilders and athletes right. often mm-hmm. uh, basically cheat by taking high levels of anabolic steroids, which are usually testosterone, it's not usually testosterone, but it's uh, Mm testosterone-like substances. And, and so, and it's got a negative, um, negative connotation, but in the public and in medicine, the weird thing is a lot of doctors think that it might be dangerous too, Mm -hmm. um, because there were stories around prostate cancer that maybe it causes it. 
And that's what I did much of my research on and, and what most within medicine, most of my uh, claim to fame, if I have any, is around uh, reversing the ideas of testosterone and prostate cancer. And then some years ago, there was a story that made big headlines about testosterone being associated with cardiovascular risks, heart yeah. risks. And that turned out to be total nonsense, but mm -hmm. it made big headlines. So, you know what, I think for your listeners, both for the men, especially, but also for the women who are listening, who have men in their lives that they care about, partner, you know, mm -hmm. spouse, uh, son, father, <laughs> grandfather, um, you know, here's what's true and what's important. So testosterone is a natural chemical, natural hormone that everybody has, men and women. Mm -hmm. Women have about 10% of the amount of testosterone that men have, but they still have it. Right. And it works pretty similarly in women as it does in men. As we get older, um, let's talk about men for a second. As men get older, by and large, after the age of 35, testosterone levels decline. Some people use the number about 1% per year. Mm -hmm. um, and at some point, the amount, if you have an abundance of testosterone, you can't tell whether somebody's got uh, crazy amounts or somebody just has good amounts. Like there's yeah. no difference in how they act or what they look. One's not going to be more muscular than the other. One's not going to be more sexual, but there's a certain threshold. And if you drop below that threshold, the further and further you drop, the more and more symptomatic you become. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and the symptoms can be again for men and women, really, um, there's less uh, less sex uh, drive. Yeah, it may be more difficult to achieve an orgasm. Mm -hmm. uh, for men, the quality of erections is often diminished. Um, men may notice that they're not waking up with erections at night or in the morning anymore. Those are the sexual symptoms. Um, and then there are these other things that affect people. And you know, as people get older, sometimes we just say. Uh, you say, how are you doing? You say, well, I'm doing all right for my age or something like yeah. that. But, you know, they're already discounting how they feel, you mm -hmm. know, and they just say, well, I, I'm sort of like some other guys, but it can affect energy. Mm -hmm. People feel tired in a way that doesn't really make sense to them. Fatigue. They may lose their motivation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people who are at work, um, you know, like in sales or something, we'll say, I, I used to be the guy that would make that extra phone call at the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why, like, I'm in the president's circle. And, you know, for the last year or two, he may say, Doc, I just want to go home and take a nap. Mm -hmm. Like, there's something different about him. He may not, it's not that he's depressed. It's not that his marriage is off. It's that he may have low levels of testosterone. And, um, and some people actually get depressed. They feel mm -hmm. blue. So, you know, part of the joke of that uh, chapter title of Men Are Hormonal Too mm -hmm. is what some of these guys who had low levels of testosterone were saying to me is, um, uh, is they say, I feel, <laughs> I go to a movie, one of, the, one of the guys I wrote about went to, he's like a, a former SEAL, super mm -hmm. tough guy. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes to see, I think it was a Disney movie with, you know, his kids. And in, in the middle of the movie, he starts crying. Mm -hmm. He says, like, I found myself so emotional. It's not me. Mm. Like, I've never cried in yeah, a movie yeah. before. I'm like the world's toughest guy. And, um, and he turned out to have low levels of testosterone. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about it is that uh, it's easily diagnosed. It's a blood test. Mm -hmm. Um. I may want to say something or we should probably talk about how to interpret those blood tests, but it's a blood test. Yeah. And the good news is that if we can restore testosterone levels to a normal place uh -huh. for men, they, those symptoms go away. They feel like themselves again. Yeah. And some, sometimes the effect is dramatic, not always, but, mm -hmm. but sometimes and women tend to lose testosterone as they go through perimenopause and into menopause. Mm. Mm -hmm. so the ovaries for you know it's the testicles that make testosterone for men the adrenal glands make a tiny little bit but they make some and in women it's the ovaries and of course with menopause the ovaries stop 
putting out yeah. all sorts of hormones uh, that includes uh, testosterone. Mm-hmm. And so when women go through menopause, they've got issues related to losing estrogen and progesterone, but they also um, have symptoms from loss of testosterone. Testosterone in women, excuse me, has many, almost all of the same effects. Yeah. So if we treat women with it, what they'll often notice their sex drive is better. Um, uh, that, uh, that they uh, can gain a little muscle, their workouts mm-hmm. are better, their energy can be better. They often sleep better. Um, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So is it concerning when you just have the natural decline in testosterone as you age, or is there uh, bigger drops? Like I, I know statistically, you know, we're seeing younger men who are dealing with low testosterone than we ever have before. And and all of those things, like if you just have a natural decline in testosterone, is that concerning or is that just a natural uh, part of life that men don't have uh, issues with? Or are you talking about these big drops that men are seeing? Yeah. So listen, that's an ongoing discussion within medicine, right? So mm-hmm. if so, and, and outside of medicine. So if something happens, let's use the word naturally. Mm-hmm. Sort of where we often take that to as a discussion is, well, maybe it shouldn't be treated then because that's natural aging. And here's what I would say. I would say that natural aging sucks. Yeah, right. Because if so you have a we, treatment, why why let yourself do that, right? Like so why listen to, all the, listen to what natural aging is associated with. It's associated with bad eyesight, uh-huh. bad teeth, bad hearing, bad blood vessels, bad hearts, bad joints. Mm-hmm. And cancer; mm-hmm. those are all natural. If you want, there. What we when we say it's associated, it's uh, associated with natural aging. All it really means is that the prevalence or the frequency mm-hmm. that these things occur becomes more common as we get older. Mm-hmm. As we get older, a lot of things go wrong, and most of them we treat if it improves our quality of life or improves our health. Right. The uh, hormones somehow have this, um, people have taken to it as if it should somehow be excluded from those other things. You know, high blood pressure is is much more common at age 60 than it is at age 30. It's age related. It's right. a nat- If you want, it's a natural part of aging. But it would be ridiculous to not treat it, right? Right. We treat it so that people can live a longer life, life without mm-hmm. heart attacks or strokes. And the same is true with testosterone. So I don't see any reason why testosterone should be the one thing mm-hmm. that creates trouble as we get older because it goes down that we don't treat because, oh, it's natural. Right. So what's the, I mean, I think, like you said at the beginning, there's a big uh, relation or correlation that I think people have in their mind between testosterone and bodybuilders. And, but that you're, what you're treating is very different than what they're accomplishing. Can you just maybe explain the difference between how you're treating testosterone and the way a bodybuilder is using it? Great. And very important question. Very important mm-hmm. distinction. So the reason bodybuilders use testosterone is because testosterone helps with muscle. Mm-hmm. So when people have low levels of testosterone, they actually lose muscle, like you can measure it. And they gain fat, by the way. So the bodybuilders are trying to have as great a physique as possible, which means bigger muscles, massive mm-hmm. muscles, and usually as low a fat percentage in their body as they can. So testosterone is part of a class of molecules that are called um, androgens. Mm-hmm. And Androgens, as a rule, uh, build up things like um, muscle, and that's called anabolism. And so they're mm-hmm. called anabolic, and it's a steroid. A steroid is just a um, a chemical structure. So cortisol is a steroid. But when we talk about people taking steroids, yeah. Yeah. you know, for bodybuilding, they're almost always talking about testosterone-like products, which are androgens. Mm-hmm. So technically, testosterone is what we call an anabolic steroid. And um, But it turns out that the bodybuilders don't like testosterone that much because there are other anabolic steroids that are much more potent at increasing muscle. Mm -hmm. So the amount of testosterone they would need to use to get to where they want to go 
it's just too much of it. But those guys don't have a medical condition. The guys who are trying to do the bodybuilding, yeah. or the athletic sort of doping or cheating. Um, and, and they end up taking the equivalent in medicine up to 50 times the natural level of testosterone. Mm. Mm-hmm. The men that I treat and that physicians treat by and large, if they treat, is um, we're treating men or women who have a deficiency. They have too little of it. Mm -hmm. And when you have too little of it, and our goal is to make it back to normal. We're not trying to get them to twice normal and certainly not 50 times normal. And that's the distinction. One group of people actually has a medical condition, Mm well-documented, well-understood for thousands of years. And, uh, well, they didn't understand it as well a thousand years ago as we do today, but it's been recognized for thousands of years. And the other group is a group that is healthy, normal, and just wants to be more muscular. Those are two very different things. And as a doctor... Um, I'm not going to make judgments about people doing it, but that's not what I do. And it's as a rule, it's not what doctors are trying to treat. Right, right. Because I feel like when we talk about a lot of things in health, more is not always better. It's balance that you're really looking to achieve. Um, So when we look at people who are really struggling with testosterone deficiencies, which do you say is becoming a bigger issue in younger men? Is that, do you see that statistic playing out? Well, I think that it is, you know, there's a couple of confusing things going on. Um, so first of all, we actually hardly ever really knew what, how common it was mm. because we didn't test very much. Right. Mm-hmm. So we don't have a lot of information, not really, mm-hmm. um, about 20 years ago, 40 years ago, how common it was that men had low levels of testosterone. There's some data points, but not a lot. Now, because there's so many people who are aware of testosterone as a possible issue, they go to their doctors and they say, can I get checked? Mm -hmm. And so we find it. Sometimes in 18-year-olds, 22-year-olds, a population that we never really would have checked before. Right. Okay. Yeah. You know, so, Mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 um, and it's funny and, I'm probably as much pro-testosterone, as much of an advocate for testosterone for medical reasons as anybody on this planet. And yet, even I get messed up about expectations. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I I do a lot of uh, consults. I get like second opinions. Right. People contact me from all around. And and recently somebody told me about a, um, a, a young guy who was, I think, 19. Uh-huh. And he went on the internet and he thought he might have low levels of testosterone. Uh-huh. And as a doctor, we kind of um, like, that's our worst headache, right? People who self-diagnose on the uh-huh. internet because everybody thinks right. they have everything, <laughs> right? And and, um, and go, oh boy, here it comes. And in my mind already, I was thinking 19, he figured this out on the internet he was having some trouble with a girlfriend. There was some social part to it. Like um, I think she was going off to college and, um, and they, they wanted to sort of consummate their relationship, mm-hmm. you know, sexually um, before she did and, and everything had been fine until then. But once they had that conversation, like then it became a problem. He had started having a problem. And I'm thinking this has another explanation, not hormones. Yeah. Um, and sure enough, his blood test came back and, and it was low. Mm-hmm. And, and the joke, is, it's not really a joke, but I was fooled. And mm-hmm. I was fooled because I, even though I'm as pro-testosterone as, mm-hmm. as I just said, um, you know, we have a bias. I have a bias. I think there's a cultural bias that you, this shouldn't be a problem for young guys. Mm-hmm. And yet, now that we start testing and looking at it, for some of them, it is. Mm-hmm. Right. And maybe in the past, like you said, we just overlooked it or didn't even think to test it or men weren't as verbal about it maybe as now it's becoming, I mean, as we talk about, it's not something that's wildly talked about, but it is talked about a little bit more about the struggles that men are facing. Are there lifestyle factors that are at play in our life today that are, are sabotaging testosterone naturally? Like how does our lifestyle influence this? 
Yeah. So I think there's two main ways to think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one is that, you know, we're getting as a population, we're getting fatter and fatter mm-hmm. and obesity decreases testosterone. One right. of the strongest. And then it releases estrogen because so, fat in men it, and women both release estrogen. So you're exactly throwing it right. out of balance. Okay. Yeah. Exactly right. So, and, and as a cute little tidbit, you know, that almost all estrogen or the, the main one, estradiol comes directly from testosterone. Mm-hmm. It's converted from testosterone and it's an enzyme. It's called aromatase and it just changes one little chemical piece on that, on that steroid backbone, mm-hmm. which is the structure of testosterone and, estri- and estradiol and testosterone becomes estradiol. And it's in fat tissue that has a lot of that enzyme called aromatase that makes that conversion. And that's why people who are more obese uh, will have less testosterone and more estradiol, men and women. So one is obesity is certainly a factor. The other one that is fascinating, and I'm by no means expert on this at all, but you know, it's, it comes under the, the uh, terminology, what we might call endocrine disruptors mm-hmm. uh, or xenoestrogens. And it's about things like pollution and plastics in our Mm -hmm. Uh, waterways and and things like that that get into the stuff Mm -hmm. that we drink or eat, um, pesticides and all that. And there's a lot of data in uh, animals, Mm -hmm. how they're, you know, progressively being affected uh, by these agents in the environment. I don't know enough. I'm not expert in in that to know how much of an impact that has on humans, but it's certainly a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we talk about, you know, on the lifestyle factors that are influencing it, so obviously ways that you can better your testosterone would be to, uh, you know, work out more. What are some of those ways then on the other flip side that we can do to naturally increase our testosterone? And have you been able to see that men can increase testosterone naturally without the use of, uh, you know, I don't know if you're using bioavailable or synthetic hormones or, or whatever it is, but the external use of hormones or yeah. do you feel like once so, it's low, it's just kind of a mute point? It depends a little bit on the age of the person. Mm-hmm. So uh, younger guys who, because there's some things that really drop testosterone yeah. that may get better over time. So for example, stress reduces testosterone. Mm-hmm. We, never me- we never measure testosterone in hospitalized patients because we know their testosterone is going to be falsely low. Because they're It's stressed. just not worth getting there's a certain level of stress. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh, and what we've seen, and I've cer- certainly seen in my own patients is that some of the younger guys who may come in who have low levels of testosterone, they've got complaints about their sex drive is down, their workouts aren't good. And they really do have low levels of testosterone. And sometimes when we talk and you find out that they're going through a divorce mm-hmm. or there's a, you know, a, a bad financial situation or their job is making them crazy or something like that. And some of those people, we may still treat them to get them through whatever that period is. But if they're young, and I would define young as under 50, let's say, mm-hmm. um, or under 45, um, when that episode of uh, that more stressful period is gone, a lot of their testosterone levels will return to normal and they don't need to be on treatment again. If you're over 50, that becomes less likely. Mm-hmm. Then it's, uh, you know, becomes much more, stress can still affect you, <laughs> but, but our levels have started dropping right. by that time. Mm-hmm. And it's more likely to be something that is um, just related to the testicles and the pituitary gland, not being as responsive as they used to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, when you see men who are, you know, coming in, they're getting tested, they're low in their testosterone. Like you said, I think we need to go back to those blood values because there are a lot of men's health clinics popping up. And this is always like a concern that I hear is how do I know if they're going to treat me, you know, the way that I need to be treated? Are there concerns for treatment? Are there things people should watch out for? Like what's kind of your average of like, this deserves or warrants testosterone replacement and this doesn't. Yeah. The, um, uh, mm-hmm. So really important. So there are a lot of doctors who say that they treat testosterone. Mm-hmm. Um, the amount of education around this has been very little. And it's really fascinating and frustrating 
um, how much the sort of, I'm a mainstream medical doctor, you know, I went to Harvard medical school. I've been on the Harvard faculty for my whole life. You know, I I was a researcher. I published over 200 articles, you know, like I'm a science-based guy. Right. And, um, and, uh, but there are very few people with my background Mm -hmm. who actually do much testosterone work. And, and because mainstream medicine itself has some biases and some of them are against this. And so while there are more and more doctors that are offering testosterone and some of them are doing it, I think rather well, um, who you go to matters right? and how they, and, 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 and how they're diagnosing or not diagnosing matters also. And I can't tell you how many uh, patients that I've seen men who clearly had classic symptoms of low testosterone, mm-hmm. classic, miserable, and had gone to see somebody good, uh, often an endocrinologist, um, and were told that either they didn't have low testosterone at all, be- based on one of the blood tests, or I'll never forget one guy, or, or that, yeah, their levels are low, but you don't really need treatment. And I'll never forget the guy who came in. He was probably, I think it was like 42. And he had no sex drive. He was married. His wife was upset they weren't having sex anymore. And um, and he wanted to be able to, it was a nice part of their relationship before. And, and he couldn't do it anymore. And, and he had very low testosterone levels. And he saw the chief of endocrinology at one of the teaching hospitals at Harvard. And the and I mentioned endocrinologists because <laughs> I should say some of my best friends are endocrinologists, yeah. but I don't have anything <laughs> against endocrinology, except it's what's fascinating is that different fields or specialties often have cultures. Mm. You know, they have like prevailing ideas. Yeah. And what we call the key opinion leaders, some of the bigger researchers who have a lot of impact on other. Uh, people within their field within endocrinology have been very dismissive of testosterone therapy. They just, I don't know if I really want to start somebody on it. And they're, you know, you can take the word cautious and you can take it to an extreme where they just don't want to treat these people. And so this young guy who uh, uh, couldn't have sex was told by the endocrinologist, yes, you definitely have low levels of testosterone, but I don't think you need to be treated. You know, the queen of whatever, Siam or something, yeah. he said to this guy, they used to have eunuchs, guys without testicles, who would uh, have positions of honor and like would oversee the harems and they were consultants. Mm-hmm. He says, those guys had no testosterone and they had okay lives. <laughs> and you've got a better testosterone than that. And I don't think you need it. And when he came to see me as a second opinion, he said, I don't really care about the queen of whatever. Yeah. (laughs) All I really want to do is take care of the princess who sleeps in the bed next to me at night. And um, so uh, going, so the issue of how do you measure it? So there are three main forms of, um, of testing for testosterone. Uh, the one that's most common is called total testosterone. If you take a drop of blood or a blood sample, um, they look at how much, how much, to- how much total testosterone there is per tiny little amount of mm-hmm. testosterone, usually measured in deciliters. And uh, the second is called bioavailable testosterone, and the third is called free testosterone. Free doesn't free means it's not attached to anything. So a little bit more than half of the of the testosterone that circulates in the bloodstream is attached to a carrier molecule. It's called sex hormone binding globulin or SHBG is, mm-hmm. is how we abbre- uh, abbreviate it. And most of that is so tightly bound that that portion, even though you can measure it, can't release itself to the cells that need it as it flows by. Mm-hmm. So that portion is not biologically available, the part that's bound to SHBG. The rest of it is considered bioavailable. And there's two parts to that. One is the part that's not attached to anything. And that's what we call free. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it doesn't cost anything, but it means it's not attached to anything. And then the other part is weakly attached to some of the other carrier proteins uh, in the bloodstream like albumin. And in theory, those can come off of those proteins as need be and enters the cell. Practically speaking, in this country, we... We really only have two tests, though, which is the total and the free. 
You can mm-hmm. get bioavailable testosterone, but people don't use it much. In Europe, it's used much, much more. And all doctors were initially trained on total testosterone. Mm-hmm. All the classic studies, even the current studies, mainly use total testosterone. The problem is, is that there's a lot of variability in that um, carrier protein, SHBG. So if you've got a lot of that carrier protein that holds it tight, even though the total testosterone may look normal, mm. the amount that's available to get in the cells, which is really the free yeah. portion, may be low. Mm. And um, so that's one problem is that if you just get total testosterone, you're probably missing at least a third of the guys who have right. whose bodies are hungry for testosterone and they won't have it. And the second is the labs give what's called reference ranges, which you know we interpret as sort of being normal. Yeah. And those reference ranges are wacky. They're mm-hmm. just wacky. Yeah. And um, and so we don't do it. But in my practice, you know what we did is if somebody has a testo- total testosterone less than 350 nanograms per deciliter yeah. and they have symptoms, candidate for treatment. If they have a free testosterone or a calculate, what's called a calculated free testosterone, less than 100 picograms per milliliter, PG mm-hmm. slash milliliter, and they have symptoms, they're a candidate for treatment. Mm-hmm. And of the men who we identify in that way, if they have symptoms and we treat them, uh, somewhere around 75 to 80% of them will see benefits and will be happy. Yeah, yeah. As we wrap up this summer series, I wanted to keep giving love to our summer sponsor, Yarlap. They are such an incredible company with value suited to helping women overcome pelvic floor dysfunction. And as I mentioned, they have helped in my own health as I have been a tried and tested believer of Yarlap for the last two years. They're the most amazing company with incredible values and an even better product that makes healthifying your pelvic floor easy and practical with their FDA-approved auto kegel technology. I wanted to ask Mary Ellen why they are passionate about creating this device. So many women had this problem and didn't want to talk about it because they thought that they only had two options. They only had surgery or pills or, you know, I guess the third option is wearing panty liners or other products that are absorbent and they just didn't want to do that. So we knew that there was a need for it. And really the trick to it is a better quality of life. Something that you don't have to think about treating. It just automatically does it for you. So you get this benefits, you get the better quality of life by just simply doing an exercise done for you. But the trick is, is that exercise is extremely, extremely, extremely difficult to do on your own. And so that's where the, the Yarlup comes in and it's beautiful and it works into anyone's routine because it just, again, does everything for you. You just sit down or lay down or walk around and it just does the pelvic floor exercises for you while you do something else, but you still get that benefit of a toned pelvic floor. We have been talking all summer long about Yarlap and even the pelvic floor and its importance in your overall health. I highly encourage you to check out Yarlap, talk to their customer support, and buy your own personal device. The health benefits are numerous and the results are pretty incredible. So make sure you head over to thelivingwell.com backslash Yarlap and use the code livingwell for $25 off your own device. Do you ever see where people have symptoms, but they don't register low on either test? So uh, pretty rarely, actually. So can it happen? It can. Um, You know, it depends what the symptoms are we're talking about, too, because testosterone affects so many different systems in the body, right? right? Like mood, bone, Mm -hmm. muscle, fat, sex drive, and all these things. You can almost link it to everything in the body at some level. Almost everything. Almost everything. It's exactly right. And some of those things, you know, our lives are complicated. Yeah. (laughs) And, and, you know, things like relationships, sexuality, if that's what we're focusing on, there's so many things that can affect that. Yeah. So it's not always testosterone. You know, the other thing I would say to you is that not everybody with low testosterone gets better. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'll never... There are a million versions of that kind of story where sort of life situations or or mental or emotional issues come into play Mm -hmm. where sexuality may still, it may not be perfect and it's not always testosterone, but I would flip it around and how I see it is, is that when testosterone level is low, 
it can be difficult to have normal sexuality, if you will. Yeah. Um, but when it's normal, as it is for most of us, especially when we're younger, that still it still doesn't protect us from having all the other issues that happen in life. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, along those same lines, uh, you know, lifestyle issues. I mean, there's some talk in the field about, you know, pornography and what is that doing to, to men and women long-term? Are you seeing any relation to how that's changing us on a hormonal level or are you not experiencing that? Like, do you see any correlation to that? Well, that's an interesting question. So pornography is a big, uh, it's really a big issue. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't seen any any data about it changing hormone levels, and my guess would be that it doesn't. But it certainly changes sexuality. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody else. I heard somebody talking about this, and they said that, um, you, you know, with with the easy access to porn now, which is universal, right? Everybody mm-hmm. has access to the internet. Um, you know, men see they can see in three minutes literally dozens or even a hundred images of the most gorgeous uh, women, if they're, if they're straight, whatever it is. Uh, Whereas before the internet, they might've seen one example of something like that in a lifetime. Right. Wow. Yeah. And, and men and women are now, especially as they're just coming of age with sexuality. Mm -hmm are having images in their brain that are so powerful Mm -hmm. that normal relations don't go there. Mm -hmm. This is new, totally new. And I just have to one and, and normal human interactions and intimacy Mm -hmm. doesn't follow the scripts of porn, Mm -hmm. right? It's different. Right. And the, the men cannot measure up to the actors who are in, you know, mm-hmm. sort of the male studs in those films. The women physically can't match up to to mm-hmm. what's there. Um, nobody has sex really the way that they see there. And you have to wonder what's going to happen to sex and sexuality. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. I mean, I I feel like on this podcast series, we've kind of been talking about uh, whether you watch porn or not, I mean, sexual health is being shaped by the porn industry in a lot of ways. We see that in women's health, you know, women trying to alter themselves to be more, right. you know, like that. And I mean, I feel like it is on men too. You know, I got some questions coming back from readers of, you know, I'm worried about the size of my erection. Um, you know, is it healthy? Is it normal? I, I don't know what you have to say about size of an erection or, I mean, obviously that's probably not something that you can change greatly, although there are some ideas that people think that they can change it. I don't know what you think about, um, you know, size of erection, if that matters to men's health, what you're seeing in that aspect. Well, that listen, that's been a common complaint forever, you know, right. uh, uh, forever. And, um, you know, it may be of interest that, that uh, to your listeners and viewers that the ancient Greeks thought that a, a, a smaller penis was more appealing than a larger penis. They thought that a larger penis was somehow uncouth, uncivil. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they also they also thought that it affected in a negative way fertility. Mm. That they thought that that the semen as it would come out would cool too much mm. as it had it had a longer passageway and that it wasn't good for fertility. It's just an interesting like twist. But a lot of guys today fig- try and like, there's this thing about a large penis, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's a, a sign of masculinity. Mm-hmm. And of course there are a lot of, um, it's always been so, but I think even more so today with devices and, and, you know, people have been cooped up for the last couple of years with COVID, like where people don't really know how they match up. Mm-hmm. And so they think about their penis and they see, especially the guys, yeah. they see these guys with, um, you know, these massive penises mm-hmm. and they say, oh my God, I'm nothing like that. You know, here's what the data are. The data, it's really, and, and, and I've seen lots of men over the years who came in either concerned about their penis size or wanted to do something about it. Yeah. And there have been a couple of procedures that we've done over the years and I've done some of them. Um, but uh, I, they've done big studies, like there was one in over 10,000 men where the average erect penis was about five and a half inches. Mm-hmm. That's the average mm-hmm. amongst 10,000 men. It's not 
seven inches. It's not eight inches. Yeah. It's not like some of these other things. And there's also data, some of this from the same study, where it turns out that the, the variation in size of the penis isn't so much between people. So 80% of men are within one inch of that average. Mm. Mm. That's it. Yeah. Now, are there people who are um, either blessed or have, <laughs> or maybe burdened with a particularly large penis or a particularly small penis? For sure. Same is true for women and, and breasts, right? Right. Like, you know, there right. are there there's some of that. Um, but you know what I say to men is that some of the most beautiful women and can consider the most beautiful in the world um, are a little bit smaller up top. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And you look mm-hmm. at some of the, so the, the famous actresses and stuff. And um, so that's not the, the end all and the be all of who we are as sexually appealing right. individuals. When the men, all they know is porn, they feel bad. Because they can't mm-hmm. ma- they can't match up. Those guys who are in some of the porn movies are selected exactly because they have unusually large penises. Yeah, it's not normal, mm-hmm. and they're part. You know, they're always worried they're going to be inadequate in some way, mm-hmm. and um, whatever partners they have, it's unlikely unless they've had a ton of partners, unlikely to have experienced anything like what you see in porn. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I had a few more questions come in from readers. Um, one guy said, I'm 26 and struggling with ED. Uh, is there something I can do? Uh, should I get my testosterone checked? Is that something that could help with erectile dysfunction? Yeah. So, you know, uh, ED, erectile dysfunction, we used to call it impotence. Um, and now the preferred term is ED. So ED can either be psychological uh, or physical. Physical means there's something wrong with your hormone levels, your blood vessels. And uh, psychological doesn't mean you're nutty. It just means usually that you're anxious, you know, mm-hmm. when you actually have mm-hmm. to do the test. So, you know, what, what's helpful probably for both of the men and women listening to you is that if a man can get an erection, there are three times, <laughs> three situations where men get erections. One is during trying to have sex with somebody. Another is with masturbation, sex on their own. And the third is um, most men, if their testosterone is okay, will wake up with erections at night or in the morning. Yeah. If the erection is firm under any of those circumstances, it means the plumbing is okay. Mm. If the penis can get firm under some some of those conditions, yeah. all that's okay. And more common is that men have a problem when they're trying to be intimate with somebody else. And especially if it's somebody they, you know, maybe they've just met or it's something they yeah. don't have much experience, the, the nerves take over mm-hmm. and we have what's called the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic, you know, yeah. and sympathetic is our fight or flight response. Mm-hmm. And when guys are nervous and their palms are sweaty and mm-hmm. <laughs> it means their sympathetic system is turned on and it makes the penis, the blood vessels in the penis not uh, expand as it needs to for an erection. Mm-hmm. So that's anxiety. Now we can treat these guys and we often do. Um, and the pills like Viagra Cialis are actually some of the safest medicines that have ever been mm-hmm. used. And even if I think it's psychological for a guy, I will prescribe him some of those meds because it helps. Mm-hmm. And if they can have one or two or three positive experiences with a partner, yeah, they, they're going to find out that they probably don't need the medicine after that. They Uh get their confidence back, their mojo back, and they're okay. If it is a physical thing, those pills are also effective. And I would definitely check a testosterone level in a guy, especially if he finds his desire isn't as good as it used to be. He's not waking up with erections like he used to, uh, has trouble achieving an orgasm even on his own. Those are all uh, sexual indicators that maybe testosterone is low. And we treat some guys even if they're as young as 26. Yeah, yeah. So you also authored a book called The Viagra Myth and kind of going along with sexual dysfunction. Why did you write that book and what, you know, kind of is, how, why would you encourage readers to check that out and, and read it? Yeah, that was an interesting book, if I say so myself. You know, so Viagra was introduced in 1998. And I was in practice for 10 years before then, and nobody talked about sex. It was really hard to, like, those were difficult conversations. Guys didn't volunteer anything. In 1998, Viagra came along with a big ad campaign 
um, encouraging people to sort of, they called it ED for the first time, really, and um, talk to your doctor about ED. And, um, and so that book was written after five years that Viagra had been around. And what I was interested in exploring then through cases of my own patients was the ways in which people, it was really about the mythology yeah. of Viagra. So people said, oh, the Viagra myth, you don't think Viagra works. No, no, no. Viagra works really well. It's not perfect. But two thirds of men who have a real physical problem will respond. Yeah. Uh, but it still means a third won't. Mm -hmm. Important to keep that in mind. But the mythology around Viagra was such, and it, it mixes in with the mythology of male uh, masculinity. You know, it's sort of uh, sex is how, and our penis size or function mm -hmm. is how men see themselves as successful sexual beings. And and what was it, what was fascinating to me is how some of these men. Um, came in thinking that they could save failed relationships mm. by taking Viagra. Yeah. And, and, you know, and if the guy was being a jerk towards his partner, no amount of Viagra and was going to change that. Mm. Um, and so there was this myth, if you will, that just taking Viagra would, one of the myths is that a, a guy needs to be like a, a, a uh, superhero in bed yeah in order in order to be an appealing human being you know and in the end sex is a really important part of life but the other parts of life and relationships matter too yeah you know being being kind and generous and and respectful and courteous and thoughtful and kind right like that stuff matters as much as as a hard penis mm -hmm. yeah yeah so fascinating okay a uh, couple more questions for you. I have a female that wrote in that um, her husband is very concerned about getting a vasectomy because he was worried it was going to influence um, him sexually. Being a urologist, uh, studying this, what are your thoughts on a vasectomy? Is it a safe? I mean, obviously it's been around for vasectomy. a while, but yeah. Yeah, vasectomies are great and they do not affect sexuality in the slightest. All they do is the testicles make two main things. They make testosterone, which gets into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. and they make sperm mm -hmm. and the sperm goes through its own set of tubes into the body, into the pelvis through a tube called the vas deferens. That's where the yeah. name vasectomy comes from. And, uh, and inside it joins the prostate and another gland called the seminal vesicles. And those three things form what's called the semen. Mm -hmm. So fluid from the prostate, fluid from the seminal vesicles, and then the sperm and its associated fluid from the testicle. With a vasectomy, the tube is uh, snipped and basically plug, plugged off or tied off or a little metal clip goes on it. And the only thing that's changed then is that that portion of fluid, which contains the sperm, can't come out when the man ejaculates. And it turns out that only is about five, maybe 10% of the amount of fluid. Most guys can't tell the difference in how much fluid they have before and after. Some guys say they can, but it's a really small difference. And it's got nothing to do with erections. It's got mm -hmm. nothing to do with feeling. It's got nothing to do with orgasm or ejaculation other than we're missing a little bit of the fluid that contains the sperm. So, you know, I did thousands in my, mm -hmm. in, in my career and uh, it's safe. Really, if you're doing it with somebody who's skilled, you get numbed up, it really should be painless. And, um, and it's an excellent form of birth control. Yeah. 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 I would tell you that there's some people have the opposite reaction to what your um, caller or reader said, mm -hmm. which is that sex becomes more pleasurable for them. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is that the fear of an unwanted pregnancy is gone. Mm -hmm. So the guys and their partners feel uh, free. Right, right. <laughs> and less inhibited. Right. Yeah, yeah. So one more question that I personally had as, you know, I get questions to if people are getting their testosterone checked. Is there, this is something that has been brought to my attention a number of times um, in regards to testosterone therapy and sleep apnea. So um, the concern of a few of my clients were, you know, if I take testosterone, is it going to make my sleep apnea worse? Because I think there's some literature that maybe is surrounding that area. What, what is your take? I mean, it's kind of like, did the sleep apnea cause low testosterone or did the testosterone making the sleep apnea worse, like chicken or egg kind of situation. But how do you deal with that when people are, who are 
actively seeking testosterone therapy? Is this a concern? Yeah, great. So that's a very sophisticated question. Uh, so good for good for you. So here's the story: any kind of disrupted sleep mm-hmm. lowers testosterone in men. So people who work in graveyard shifts, and this is probably related to the stress story that I talked about before, yeah. where stress lowers testosterone. It often disrupts sleep too. Impaired sleep, including sleep apnea, lowers testosterone. Mm-hmm. And, um, and when we were talking about what can people do to improve naturally their testosterone is one is usually drop some weight and two is try and get in a good sleep regimen. The issue that the second issue you raised though, is around should, should, could testosterone therapy, um, make sleep apnea worse? And the answer is no. Okay. This has been studied really extensively. Um, uh, there's very little association with sleep apnea and testosterone, mm-hmm. very little. And the uh, there was one report that maybe suggested something gets a little bit worse, but a number of other studies have shown nothing. I don't believe it. If you have sleep apnea, get treated for it. Once you're treated, I think there's universal agreement. It's okay to go on testosterone if you, if you need it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. No, that... Uh... That makes sense. I mean, I feel like if you treat testosterone, I mean, all the functions in your body should start to work a little bit better together. And also it should influence your sleep. I mean, I, I suppose that's not maybe one of the first, you know, side effects that you would see from testosterone replacement, but if you have more drive in life, you're going to use some more energy anyway. People, yeah. yeah. People, people will say that they sleep better when they're on testosterone therapy. Mm-hmm. Okay. One last question. Then we got to go. What is your advice for men who, you know, maybe this is, I mean, on the podcast, ironically, I have half, half my listeners are males. So, um, what do you, what advice do you give them when they listen to this, when they're, you know, kind of concerned, when should they go seek help? What could they do in their everyday life? Like what is those last piece of advice that you want to give men? So, you know, what I would say is it's tough to be a guy these days mm-hmm. and, um, and it's hard to know what's real, what's not real. And, and um, guys don't get a lot of support as a rule. They tend to not get good health care either. They tend to yeah. feel like it's a sign of weakness if they go to the doctor. And yet there's so much information and often misinformation that's available on the internet. Mm-hmm. And what people tell them, even though their friends and partners may be well-intentioned, a lot of it's wrong. So here's what I would say. First of all, erectile dis- in terms of sex, erectile dysfunction is common, really common, and um, and the treatments are pretty safe, really safe. Mm-hmm. And a lot of men are happier if they can perform better sexually. Mm-hmm. Second is testosterone deficiency is common, and um, and it's worth it's just a blood test, and it's also worth trying to get that checked out. Men's levels of testosterone are low. Treatment can make a huge difference in his life. And the safety profile of this is really excellent. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So, um, you know, if, if somebody wants, if somebody likes this kind of uh, stuff we've been talking about, if I could, I would suggest my last book, which is called the truth about men and sex. Yep. It's a lot of mm-hmm. stories from my practice. Some of them are uh, incredible and and it talks about some of the treatments and the things that we do. And it's a fun, if I say so myself, I, I think it's a fun read and eye-opening for people because our ideas about men and masculinity are uh, largely wrong, yeah. largely wrong. Um, and I would do that. And if somebody wants to, um, if you have anybody that's dealing with some of these testosterone issues uh, and wants to get a hold of me and we do some phone consult educational type stuff, um, they can contact uh, uh, Men's Health Boston, mm-hmm. uh, which is my uh, practice, and um, and ask for Sarah, and Sarah can hook you up. <laughs> and then the last thing is that uh, we we're about to launch our new platform. Uh, it's going to be. It's not up yet. It's called uh, T, uh, the number four L mm-hmm. <laughs> for test. Oh, li- I'm sorry. T, the number four life education. And it stands for my book, Testosterone for Life. Mm -hmm. So it's capital T, number four, lifeeducation.com. And we'll be up shortly with a lot of information. Yeah. I'll make sure and link all of that up in the show notes and let my listeners know when that goes live, because I'm sure people are going to be interested in checking that out. But I really appreciate you being here and sharing your wealth of wisdom. 
And I, yeah, I think that this is going to open the eyes to a lot of men and hopefully they can reach out, read some of your books and, and check out where they can learn more about you. So thank you so much for being here. I'm so glad that you could be on the show. It's been a pleasure, Alexa. Thank you. I'm so glad that you got to listen to Dr. Morgan Toller explain more about men's health and the need to understand testosterone, not just in men, but in women. Now, don't forget to check out his work at Men's Health Boston, and I will make sure and link all of his books in the show notes. And now I must say, this is the end of the Sex Talk series. I am so glad that you tuned in. If you missed any of the previous 10 episodes, I would recommend you go back and check those out. These are forever going to be here, so you have plenty of time to listen as you go or to binge them. Now, I realize that the sex talk is probably not the most shareable podcast series as it's personal, maybe a little bit embarrassing, but I do encourage you to have uh, your friends and family listen to it. Whoever you can tell or you feel comfortable telling, please share this podcast with them. And if you don't feel like sharing it, but you want to help us out, make sure you leave a rating and review. It really does mean the world to us and it also helps other people who wouldn't otherwise hear about the podcast, find it, check it out, and join us in this like-minded community to get back to our design, to live in health, not for it. And honestly, in the process of that, energizing your body so you can get out and live. Now, of course, you can follow along at everything that's going on over at The Living Well. Sign up for our email list to make sure that you're in the know on what's to come. And stay tuned because the next series coming out is all about the Enneagram and how to live healthy, not just in your diet and exercise, but in your sexual wellness and your everyday life. We're going to talk all about it on the Enneagram series that's launching in just another month. So stay tuned. And as you wait for that, don't forget to head on over to thelivingwell.com to check out more about sexual wellness, so many other good things going on over there. And don't forget to sign up for the Hormone Reset if you're struggling in any way, shape, or form, or really just want to jumpstart your body. That is a great program to dive into on your own time. It only takes five days and your entire family can do it with you. Again, check that out over at thelivingwell.com. Okay, I'll see you back here in the next series all about the Enneagram. I'll see you soon.